to call this work session to order on AO 2019-99. We have an S version, uh, registered hosting platforms. Go ahead and start with introductions. I'll start uh, with Davidson. Thank you. Forrest Tumbler. Crystal Kennedy. John Weddleton. Suzanne LaFrance. Felix Herrera. Dan <coughs> Moore Treasury. Liz Cruz, Treasury. Uh, also Paula Rice, where you can skip Treasury. Raise your hand there. And then, do we have uh, anyone representing operators or hosting platforms to speak today? If you could introduce yeah. yourself for the record. I'm Krista Scott, and I own Ben and Breakfast and Show. My name is Bridget Humphrey. I own a Bed and Breakfast in Eagle River, especially Bed and Breakfast. I've been in operation since 91, so it's a long standing relationship between the municipality and I, and I look forward we will. Settle this issue. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, we'll talk about it. everyone. Absolutely. Anyone else? Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Treasury. Okay. So we will get started. We have a handout here if everybody can. It looks like this. Can I just briefly? Also, Julie Southgate. Were you going to? Oh. Do you have some points? Oh, I thought he was just looking for owners and operators. Uh, Julie Southgate, which is at Anchorage, um, we share in the cost of enforcement. Okay. And you can call David the representative observer. Okay, so uh, we're going to be speaking from these slides that you have. And um, what we're trying to do is sort of back up a bit because uh, the hosting platform issue has been around a number of years. And uh, we addressed this initially uh, a certain way a few years ago. And now we're kind of trying to take it to the next step. Up. So. Uh, if you look at the very first slide, we thought we'd just start with what, what we see or how we would describe in very simple terms what is a host of platform. Uh, it's an entity that is uh, offering uh, online through a website uh, rooms for rent. So they're basically their mechanism to advertise those rooms. In addition, these, these particular platform entities that we're talking about are ones that actually collect payment for, of the rent uh, on their website. So, uh, so there is a transaction that occurs, um, the room tax is assessed, and then they collect it. Or, or it's just even the room rent if they choose not to collect the room tax. Examples are Airbnb, which is we're very well known, DRBO, and HomeAway, which is part of the family of companies. There are many others uh, uh, that are also a few other big names, like Booking.com, Expedia, uh, place like that. Um, but basically, Airbnb has been our focus because they're the only ones so far that have voluntarily come forward to, uh, to help collect room tax. So that is what we see as what is a hosting platform. In terms of what we say is not a hosting platform, if it were a service online that is only doing the scheduling of rooms, uh, the booking with no payment being taken, we do not consider that part of our definition in the code or hosted platform, they would then not be required to uh, remit and pay tax. Uh, the second one is if it's a branded platform, such as Hilton or Marriott or some of these other major hotel chains, they do centralized reservation services that are somewhere out in the world that then serve the local uh, uh, franchise properties that exist here in Anchorage. So that also would not be subject to this ordinance. Uh, the history is on page three. The history is that back in uh, 2016, an ordinance was passed unanimously by the assembly to define the term hosting platform and to uh, tie in uh, the option for voluntary compliance. And uh, so we set up a, uh, a set of rules within code in our room tax chapter to uh, create an opportunity for hosting platforms to come forward and to voluntarily register with us and to agree to collect the tax in the name of the municipality. Uh, the objectives of this original ordinance were to level the playing field because we felt there were a lot of entities, uh, operators out there, uh, and platforms that were uh, generating business in the room rental area, but they weren't collecting the tax. They weren't passing it on to us, and there was quite a bit that was not, not occurring. So. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a shadow industry. It's, it's something that uh, we're limited in terms of knowing what's out there. It's basically we pursue properties that come to our attention, but we do not have any source that tells us all the properties that are, that are out there that are, that are being offered for rent. Um, and it's uh, a very efficient way of doing 
government, right? So if we have one major responsible entity like Airbnb saying, hey, we have a whole bunch of individual operators out there that we, we serve, if we can just have that one single entity pay tax on behalf of many, many, many operators, it's highly efficient. Highly efficient for us, and it's also really good for the small operator if they exclusively operate off of a, a hosting platform. <coughs> so let's go on to the next page. This is uh, slide four. Uh, just a little bit more on the history. So when we set up this platform with the assembly's approval, Airbnb was uh, the only entity at that time which uh, was interested and uh, willing to enter into a contract, a voluntary contract. So we have a very formal contract that spells out all these terms. We work with our law department, we work with their law department. And, uh, and we got a contract signed. It was signed in 2016. They went live with this whole process on August 1st, 2016. So they began booking rooms, collecting the tax, and uh, hanging on to that tax in a, uh, in a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Fiduciary uh, capacity uh, starting at that time. If we look <coughs> at Airbnb and we say, okay, how much do they collect? We cannot tell you the amount of tax. We know the number, we can't tell you, it's confidential. But if we, if we were to say, we were to rank all the hotels, every single entity that we know about that's registered with us, Airbnb is the eighth largest entity that we have. They are very, very significant. And the original uh, summary of economic effects that we had presented, you know, we did our best to try to estimate. Again, it's a shadowy industry. We don't know. And I can tell you, it's many times greater than we, what we thought it was going to be. It's very significant. So, um, so that's the background. We had great success. It's, the model proved itself. It's, it's terrific, okay? What happened is, in late April of this year, Airbnb came to us and said, hey, you know that voluntary agreement we have? We'd like to amend it a little bit. We'd like to sort of have this uh, new clause put in that would allow certain entities, and it's not really clear who they're talking about, to opt out and not to have to have Airbnb collect the tax on their behalf. And we didn't like that. We thought, why, why would we do that? That's going backwards, right? And, and who knows, you know, once that starts, how many, you know, will choose to opt out? Yeah, go ahead. It was actually for Airbnb to continue to assess the tax, but instead of remitting the tax to the municipality, they would just remit it to the actual host, the operator, and then it would be where the operator then would remit it to us. So they would still be assessing the tax, but they wouldn't be doing the final right. part and of remitting it to would us. We then have to trace who the operator is and did they ever give us a tax, right. and it, it just becomes highly risky to us. So, um, so in. Um, and that was in late April. They gave us 120 days, and they basically said, here's our proposal. They basically said, if we don't hear from you, we're going to assume you accept it. And we wrote them right away and said, we don't accept this. This does not sound good to us. So as the summer went by, we started thinking about this. We communicated a, at least a couple rounds with Airbnb. And we said, you know, we, we should make permanent what we have here because and we'll get to this in a second, but there was a major U.S. Supreme Court decision that came out about a year ago, and it gives us a lot more leverage than we had three years ago. And so we now have a very solid reason to say it no longer needs to be voluntary, it can be, it can be required and permanent. And so that's kind of what, uh, what spurred our, our uh, coming forward this summer, and also the timeline here, we'll see it in a minute, it's actually highly sensitive that we would have this revised ordinance put in place by the end of August because that term, the amendments that have been proposed, uh, we had 120 days and that expires at the end of August. So um, they could, if they want to, just cancel the voluntary agreement altogether and then we'd be completely out of everything. So um, anyway, so that's uh, what we did in the proposal. The ordinance that's before you now is it eliminates that voluntary aspect It makes it required. The timeline is on page five. And what we show here is what, what I've just covered. So it shows, you know, in 2016, everything that began uh, in terms of the authority. Uh, Airbnb began to act as a tax collection agent for room tax in August 1st of 2016. And then we did contact VRBO uh, multiple times through formal letters, and VRBO never responded anything to us at all. And VRBO is just part of a family of companies. There's, a, there's quite a few of them. And they know what Airbnb does, but they don't want to do the same. And uh, so we've tried multiple times. 
Then in June of 2018, about a year ago, the Supreme Court had a, a case called South Dakota versus Wayfair. Very, very significant case. It allowed uh, entities that had like a general sales tax to begin to tax internet sales that went across state lines. And uh, so that is, I'm not a lawyer, but Bliss, just you know, Bliss went to law school literally. She's leaving in about 20 days. Paul is going to replace her, and she's going to become a law clerk and then a full-time lawyer. So, uh, so, so Bliss wrote a special paper about a year ago on the Wayfair decision and how it applies to like room tax and everything else. So, uh, but basically, it's uh, it's nexus. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but it, but it's like they're doing business here. It doesn't matter that they're out in the stratosphere. It's like they are doing business, and because of that, uh, they have an obligation to abide by the laws that we have and to collect the tax. And so that was a major change, and it should we should use that to our benefit in, in room tax and in other taxes too. Uh, but room tax is the one we're trying to focus on right now. Um, so. We went ahead and um, we had made these attempts to be RBO, came up empty, and then we started the process knowing that Airbnb was getting a little bit shaky with their agreement, said, okay, we need to formalize this, and we started that this summer. In early August, that's when we, um, it's like, uh, we did the introduction of the assembly. Before introduction, we notified both Airbnb and VRBO by letter, and, uh, and then we had the assembly introduce the ordinance. A few days later, we, uh, we had gotten, I think through John Weddleton, we had a, a letter from the uh, Anchorage Bed, Bed and Breakfast Association, and uh, it had quite a few detailed comments. I saw there's a letter here on the table today. A lot of the same comments in today's letter were given to us in the other letter. And what we did is within a few days, and this is on Friday the 9th, so it was a week ago, uh, we met, meaning uh, the CFO, Treasury, uh, Julie from Visit Anchorage was there, and the uh, the vice president of this association was there, and we talked through all the details of this letter. Uh, spent a good amount of time doing that and, and explained kind of where we're coming from. Uh, we understand where an individual operator and a bed and breakfast, you know, we understand where their view is and all, all of it, but we, we really have a much bigger, different view that we're trying to make sure, you know, the room tax is, is covered as much as possible. So, um, so anyway, we introduced it, and then we had the meeting with industry, and then we further communicate with Airbnb. We want to make sure that Airbnb knows this process is going on. We don't want them to come in after you have approved it, if you do approve it, and say, well, man, we don't really like this word, and so we're going to get out of it. It's like we have let them know they have, well, there's the work session, there's the, inter, the uh, original ordinance, there's the S version, there's the public hearing. We've told them this is your chance to speak up. And uh, so uh, we want this to stick. We don't want to lose ground or to lose that all, all entirely. So, so that's what our purpose is in, in bringing this ordinance forward. Public hearing is scheduled for next Tuesday night. And again, that's really close to the 120-day time frame that we have from the moment. Um, so that's, there is some real sensitivity there. On the next page, and I'll hurry along here so we can get more into open questions, but um, I already talked about um, what we're doing here and the reasons for it and the decision. Uh, and the connection to uh, feedback from the industry. We are completely open to feedback. This letter that's on our table today, we can meet with the representative that wrote it and we can go through it all, all over again just like we did a week ago, okay? So it's, I don't think, unless I have to look through it, I don't think there's any big surprises in there. Uh, but we, we, can, we can do that partially today and we can certainly do it Monday if we need to, so. All right, uh, if we're on page seven, um, what are we actually changing? Okay, so previously it was voluntary. That's the first bullet. Second bullet is, it's now required. So if you're deemed a hosting platform and you can define that way in code, you're required to register with Treasury and report and remit the tax on behalf of all those operators that you uh, service. This, again, further uh, levels the playing field so we don't have, well, Airbnb agrees to do it, VRBO doesn't, doesn't want to do anything. So, and now it's going to say everybody has to do it. And it'll be our job to go knock on the door of VRPO and everybody else and say, guess what, the law just changed, it's mandatory, you must do this. And we will involve our law department as necessary to, to enforce that. It's not it's <coughs> not real bad, it's not easy, but that's what we're prepared to do. Um, okay, so that's that. If we go on to the S version, S version just cleaned up a few things. A lot of it was driven by uh, the input that we received from industry a week ago. 
So we clarified definitions and uh, we tried to, <coughs> tried to fix some wording that was a little bit off or a little bit confusing in the original version. So that it wasn't a lot of changes, but you see how it's marked up. It shows you what changed in the S version, and the AM is uh, specific to that too. Okay, so the last two pages here on page nine, the benefits of the hosting platform compliance. It brings equity to the room tax collection area. And uh, so we do anticipate multiple hosting platforms with a lot of scale will get on board and start to do what Airbnb has been doing the last three years. In the administrative and efficiency, and this is a really key point because I know with the uh, uh, Bed and Breakfast Association, they say, well, we should just have every individual operator register with us no matter what, and then we should cross-check what those records say versus what Airbnb reports. And that all sounds fine, but Airbnb is not going to tell us the detailed records of who they serve. They're just not. We've already tried that. And it's not efficient for us in Treasury with a very small group to go after a thousand individual operators. It, it makes no sense to us. I mean, I, I don't mean to be glib or whatever, but it really makes no sense to us. So, so we're trying to keep things as efficient as possible and as comprehensive as possible. We don't want the leakage. We don't want to go, gosh, do we have the whole story or not? And so, so that's what it's about. Is if we were to do it where we everyone's registered no matter what, very lengthy, very costly to discover, to enforce actions on that large of a, of a number. Uh, it also, uh, by, by consolidating uh, with, this, with this ordinance, we reduce the number of registrations, we reduce the number of returns that we process on a quarterly basis. What it does is it eliminates a thousand registrations and the process associated that with that that go to the operators. Yep. And uh, almost done. Uh, okay. All right. And uh, let's see. And then on the private sector effects, if you, and this is a really good thing in, from my standpoint and from Treasury's standpoint, is if we have it where all platforms are now required to collect the tax on behalf of those uh, operators, if that's the case and, and an operator chooses to use only online platforms, then they have no paperwork. They don't have to register with us because the online platform is who's registering with us, and they don't have to collect and remit and track all that tax on a quarterly basis. So it relieves the individual operator of a burden that they otherwise would have. And we have gotten a lot of positive comments from many operators since Airbnb came on board that this is great. This is really working for, uh, from, from their standpoint. So, um, okay, summary is, uh, last page, uh, so we're trying to bring clarity, equity to the industry, or to the subject of the industry. Uh, we're moving forward to achieve full hosting platform so that there's not some do it, some don't. And then the third bullet here makes permanent the terms and conditions we have operating under, Air, uh, that we have been operating with under Airbnb for the past three years. And it preserves the comprehensive room tax revenue collection mechanism that is in place. And they have it all automated. It's very slick. So it's slick for the host and it's slick for us. I mean, everything's really, it's very well built. And it's very doable and it's very efficient on all sides. So with that, uh, that's our presentation. And uh, we do recommend approval of the S version Tuesday night if, uh, if you're willing to, <coughs> to do that. So thanks. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, I remember the original debate where we set this up uh, back in 2016. And my understanding was even back then that a number of cities had already gone down this route. I mean, Airbnb, VRBO are all over the country. So is this mandatory payment system, a registration system, using the centralized platforms rather than the distributed hosts, is that standard practice in other cities around the country? It is becoming standard practice, yeah. We're not the first to do it. Yeah. And in so, fact, yeah. HomeAway actually has a similar site, a similar page on their site to Airbnb where they list a whole bunch of jurisdictions where they've already started doing this. We just were unsuccessful at joining that list. So it's not just Airbnb. It is starting to be some of the other platforms. Yeah. Great. So that is the trend, and it's, yeah, we're, we're following that. Can you give me an example? But, so someone can cancel and ask like two or three cities that are on that list? Sure, I, off the top of my head I can. There's there's a big list of them, but you you know off the top of your head list. Well San Francisco. 
good. That's a big one. There's a lot going on. People love Airbnb. hearing how we can become San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping more like Minneapolis. Yeah. <laughs> or, oh, uh, I don't think Minneapolis. Ohio. Ohio. It's listed on their website. Yeah. So we okay. can, we can I mean, it's not them. just, yeah. they have it by state, and then they have it further, I think, by city, but then it's also global. They have it sure. in actual other countries where they're doing this too. So it's it's much bigger than when we did it in 2016. It's been growing. Okay. There's There are cities in Oregon. These are things just off the top of my head, but there, we there's a lot. This. Is so it a, more than series. not? Yeah. More cities than it's not? Okay. Uh, it's surprisingly a long list. Uh, I feel like so, pay tax. Yeah. It's more states than not, but they have some sort of okay. relationship with some city within the state. So dozens of cities and states around the country. For sure. Around the world. Mm-hmm. Okay. Did you have a little more clarity well, on that I, question? I, I, there are a lot of cities in the agreements, but they're she all can, can you listed, so all in town. Yeah, and actually, could you uh, say your name again for the record? Hi, Krista Scott. Can I come up here? Yes. Krista, who are you with again? Can you say? I own a bed and breakfast, and I'm with the Bed and Breakfast Association. Awesome. Um, but I've seen a lot that it's still voluntary. I haven't seen city other cities where it's become a, a requirement yet. Um, the last one that I saw last night, which I think was San Francisco, but I've not found a single city that does not require the operator <coughs> to register. But sorry, that does or does not. That does not, and there's like, I mean, we can look. At, there's like 25 cities <laughs> and states that still require. So it's you know less. Uh, you're still not doing all of the reporting, but there's still a registration, and then that would put the municipality in a position to. If Airbnb were to pull out or go out of business, or I mean, these companies, they're software companies, things happen to them overnight. We would still have a list of who's on there. But that was just my point on that. I've seen lots of cities, but they're not mandated. They're still voluntary. So I don't know of a city that's mandated it and it's worked. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, uh, after we go through assembly questions, I'll invite operators to come up and, and speak. Sure, yeah, go ahead. So I did just want to say that before we had the voluntary agreement with Airbnb, we did have the individual registration requirement, so that's always been a requirement. We only had the, if someone were exclusively using Airbnb, once we had the voluntary system, that they didn't have to register with us. And seeing how we went from Airbnb having you know, having nothing with them to them becoming the eighth largest taxpayer, that gives an idea of where we were at with voluntary compliance with a code mandated requirement that was already there. So. And I'll just add one other thing. We could, in theory, we could say all individual operators are, are responsible for registering. Like Bliss said, they, they actually don't do that in a great <laughs> compliance way. But, but even if we have that entire list, Airbnb has told us they're not going to give us any list of detail to cross-reference. So we'd just be collecting data without being able to use it anymore. Uh, so, okay. Um, so, uh, anyone else have questions? I know I do. Yeah, Mr. White. I have a question for Krista, or should I wait? It's up to you. Um, if we have questions for staff, let's do that, okay. and we'll do operators. Um, so, it was curious to me, and I think some of us were um, wrinkling our brows a little bit when you were talking, uh, uh, and you used the term shadowy industry several times. Um, why is this data confidential? It's, it's their model. They, they, don't, they do not release it, and so we can't make them. The only way we can make them, the laws here, I think, is if we had sort of, oh, yeah, I'm not the lawyer, this <coughs> lawyer, but uh, if we have probable cause, yeah. I mean, some very serious reason, we can take an court and say, produce the records and tell us who, who it is you're representing or who you're covering. But, uh, but yeah, that's that's their model, and they, they, there's reasons for that, but uh, but we can't force them to do it. And so. I actually have something to add, just based off of the recent conversations that I had with an Airbnb representative. They consider it, it's not the exact words that they use, but it was something along the lines of, of personally identifiable information. That's what they consider it, so they don't, they're not going to be spreading that to anyone because they consider that to be confidential personal identification that they have gathered from their particular hosts. They had a special word. I, I don't remember what they called it. Okay. Um, <coughs> when did this uh, Supreme Court case come out? June. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so it's been out a, a while. So since then, 
mm, uh, a lot of cities have taken this up, or? Uh, well, we just know there's a trend of making, and Airbnb has told us that there are multiple cities that it is now mandatory, so it's uh, it's not, yeah, I mean, I know the person there was saying she saw one or something, but it's, it's multiple. And it is an early trend, but it is a trend that's going to keep growing. So, I mean, if you have a choice between, well, should keep voluntary and mandatory, cities are going to say, cities and states are going to say mandatory. So. All right. Um, any other questions for staff? Yeah. Um, so there's just a, really just a few points in this letter. Um, maybe you can go through it. Sure. One that really jumps out to me is, maybe it's the most shadowy part, is people rent out homes for, or rooms in their home or something through this. And, and is that covered by the tax? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a short-term rental, yes. So it's just how long it is. So if someone goes, rents it out for 31, 32 days. Yeah, they, they, not that's covered. a long-term rental. Yeah. So it's just 31. 30, 30 days or less. Yeah. 30 days. Okay. 29 days or less. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. All right. Um, so if we don't have any more questions for staff, do any of the operators want to speak to this? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Whoever. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> right, well, just to clarify, uh, I there are two that I recall that have mandated it, but I don't believe they've gone into actual enforcement yet. But there are voluntary agreements. And I said that I did not find a single city that didn't have the requirement of having the whole operator register. And I did not find one example where it's whether they comply or not, it's still a requirement. And Airbnb is being used as a way to communicate to those operators, I think before a lot of people don't really know they're supposed to do it. Um, and so if you have Airbnb being able to communicate to their hosts, and there are some cities who have required that Airbnb publish the number, the registration number of the applicant. So it's not Airbnb sharing the personal information, but it's Airbnb, it's the host giving Airbnb my registration number. Um, so there's just that. Um, the for me, you know, leveling the playing field is a big deal. I realize that it's less work for the municipality, and we want to collect taxes efficiently, and I appreciate that. Um, but at the same time, there are things when we fill out our tax forms that we have to certify to, we have to certify that <coughs> that we have sold this much tax, so, and and there's just no accountability at all for those other hosts, so um, even Airbnb can continue to collect the tax and remit the tax, and the municipality doesn't have to do anything with the data if they don't want to, but um, at the end of the day, every year or two years, an operator should be certifying that yes, they're still only operating on this platform, or they've gone to other platforms. Um, and that was a big question for I, it seems like I think the changes are really good that were made to not include the branded hotels. I think that's a big problem, and I think that's really why Airbnb changed. Is they're going to be moving towards just becoming another Expedia or Booking.com, so they want to work with hotels and hotels that said we already have a system for paying our taxes. Um, but I think, like in some cities I found, it was really impacting realtors. Uh, there were other effects, so like realtors who maybe manage properties for homeowners for executive rentals um, and collect, a, collect rent for short-term rental and give it to the owner, technically they would fall under this. So I just, uh, I realize that this is being done quickly because we're going to lose Airbnb's money, but at the same time, do we really understand what we're undertaking? So I've asked if we have a, like a full list of platforms that we know that this will impact and kind of what the plan is to get them to comply is a big question that I think should be considered. Thank you. So, yeah, that was actually, yeah, Mr. Wilson. Okay, go ahead. Um, you know, hearing your comments and reading this, it sounds like this is actually okay, but you'd like to see an additional step. So, if this were passed, it actually helps 
equal to playing field, but it doesn't have all the elements you're looking for. But this is way better. This pass as it is is way better than where you are now. Is that correct? Well, it's certainly better that the municipality is collecting tax from everybody. Yes, but it, um, but it, you could, by adding the registration piece, again, whether it's enforced or not, Airbnb can communicate to their host, you are required to register. Right now, I think you check a box saying that you've abided by all the local rules. Um, I think that piece would more level the playing field. What element of having everyone register helps? Well, when I pay our taxes, we have to do it quarterly. We have to give our occupancy rate, uh, our, our rates. I don't know that Airbnb has to report on that. But we, there used to be data that we used to get that we could infer from the reporting that the tax department did. So I could look like under the other category for bed and breakfast and see, oh, there were this many um, units sold and the rates were, and then I could infer like what the occupancy rate would be. And so now that Airbnb has come on, I, they're not reporting on occupancy rates. I don't think, I mean, it's just like an honor system. We just take the payment from them. And so uh, at the end of the day, you know, I could be charged perjury if I mess up my taxes, but what is this host? There's no responsibility for them. Uh, is it not still there? Are they not still responsible for the tax? I mean, that's another question. If this goes into effect tomorrow or whenever, after Tuesday, does that mean that if I pay to booking.com that I'm off the hook and I'm just going to assume booking.com is remitting that tax? Because that's kind of how it reads to me. That sounds right. Can I? So if someone books a room with you through an online host and collects the tax, then they'll submit it. Are there things that you might do that would be taxable that wouldn't be done through the host. Like, um, I don't know, sometimes you go to a hotel and you know they charge for you know, breakfast or something like that and they add it on to the bill later. So I might have paid through Expedia, but then I added on these other things through the hotel. Yeah, I mean, that can happen. I think a lot of those platforms do have the functionality that you can do add-on services um, to it. And I think that it would still be part of the tax. But certainly, you could have an operator. I mean, guests show up and things change all the time. So, oh, I'm adding extra nights. Hey, we actually need a week or whatever it is. And they're going to pay you directly. Uh, you don't want to go through the host. You'd rather not go through the host. You pay them a commission. Um, now, yeah, some would be, some are easier, but at the, at the same time, you try to keep it as much as can on your own. You try to get as many direct bookings as you can on your own. And so if I could, so you, currently that happens, and so you would, if you did Airbnb and they've been paying your taxes, but if someone added a couple of days, you would write that down in your report? And yeah, that would be yours, and certainly right. that happens. So that'll continue to happen. That'll continue But you're still in a better position than you were not getting here. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Uh, Ms. Kelly. Uh, no, thank you. I uh, so on an, another point, I had a, a question, and then, uh, ma'am, I'll, I'll let you testify. So uh, one of my um, pet peeves is when something comes before the assembly and we're sort of forced on a deadline for it. Can you explain why this is really a deadline? Because uh, why does it matter if Airbnb decides to take away their voluntary agreement? If they take away their voluntary agreement, uh, we could potentially lose the eighth largest hotel in the so that's fine. And we did submit a request to legal department months ago, so it's not like we just started work on this recently. Uh, you know, we did, I think Alex helped kind of say, we got to get going on this, and uh, and so we did. I mean, you know, it came out of law, I think, two or three weeks ago. Uh, so we hurried as much as we could once it came out of law. That's, you know, but we haven't been waiting to 11th hour to try to address it. We've been working on it, so. Um, all right, go ahead, ma'am. Right. Um, like I said, I've been in business since 91. If you could say your name again for the record. My name is Bridget Humphrey, Alaska Shelley, Bed and Breakfast. I'm sorry. 
And we started out with no uh, bed tax for the smaller bed and breakfast, but then we were included in providing bed tax to the municipality and then uh, went up to 12%. And everybody that applies uh, or that runs a bed and breakfast has to apply for a business license and a permit. So the city, if they get the money through the permit, is an additional incentive to keep records through the online platforms. If the online platform does not have a requirement of their clients to provide verification that they actually comply with the city ordinance of having a registration, if, they, if the clients just check a box and say, yes, we do, but there's no follow-up, there's no copy that they have to submit and my suggestion is I fully support making it a requirement to have the uh, online platforms collect bed tax, so 100%. So if they uh, make it, they have a volunteer right now, if they make it mandatory, that would give the online platform a verification that this person is registered. That means to the municipality, you have a record on their uh, application with a number. This is just for the bookkeeping, that's just giving you an indication this is a legit um, entity that's working with the platform. Booking.com, I'm uh, registered now with Airbnb and I'm also registered with Booking.com. I love Airbnb. Airbnb is totally simple. They charge 3% uh, commission and uh, have everything paid to them and then they provide you with the money that uh, is yours to keep. They pay the bad tax but I'm also an independent operator. I have a website fully established ever since whenever, 95 or so. So I'm also signing up guests independently. I have to comply with all the guidelines and the requirements and the law of the municipality. If I don't, I am fined, and that happened twice by mistake. I was late, and once was a math error. I didn't do my math correctly, inadvertently, not on purpose, but I was heavily fined, 15% on each, the outstanding and the difference. So 30%, that's a heavy fine that tells me you guys are serious to make sure that everybody contributes their taxes to the municipality, those that are required under law, that run a lodging establishment, should register. So in order for that to make it a little easier on the municipality, my suggestion is to require verification of each host that is uh, on the platform to have that platform verify their registration, not just by checking a box, but by actually submitting a paperwork. They have to submit all kinds of paperwork, pictures, descriptions, there's a long list of requirements that the online platform asks of the host that signs up to, to provide before they become a full-fledged uh, operator, or yeah, host operator with the host, with the platform. So, we have been working with the municipality for many years, 15 years, I think, ever since the uh, municipality required everybody to collect by tax, not just the hotels, but everybody, including the little bed and breakfast like me, three rooms and less. We have tried to get the platform, or what is it, leveling the playing field, as it is said. And it was very difficult because the municipality saw the intensity, the workload, the maybe extra cost by a position, creating a position for other person that would follow up on that. But we have always maintained that if it is demanded of us, the Anchorage Bed Breakfast Association, that goes and gets a permit 
to be complying with the law, it should also be demanded of all those other operators. And since we, the individual hosts, cannot follow you know, them, it is, in my opinion, the responsibility of the municipality to do that, to find those operators of lodging facilities. This, their benefit <coughs> is your benefit too, because the industry expands. Booking.com is huge. Airbnb is getting bigger. If there are loopholes, people that don't want to register with the municipality because it's voluntary, they will use the loopholes. So I would say you tighten up pretty tight. Even so, it costs a little extra work, maybe a new position to check to see who is on the platform. You can access it. You can ask us. We are on the platform. We can give you all the information that you need to find all the members of Airbnb and all the members that operate in Booking.com in this municipal area. Get somebody, you know, to, to do that. Maybe have a small position to do that. So I hope you pass that and we will be finally done with that. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Wells. Uh, right. I guess a question for Dan. So, so if they have to report quarterly and if they do something wrong, it's a 15% penalty, I guess. There's a graduated penalty uh, based on whether it's uh, uh, occurs in the first seven or eight days and then the next eighth day and the 15th day. It's a 10% penalty for late filing and a 10% penalty for late payment on the eighth day and then it graduates up another 15% to become a full 25% if it goes past the 16th or 17th day. I can't remember specifically in the code yet. Very steep. And it's two separate penalties, filing and paying. Okay, so would these same penalties apply? Well, I do it, but Airbnb, they don't pay you. Mm -hmm. They pay you a week late. Right. So mm -hmm. you dig it with a fine. Is there a way, what if they say, no way? Uh, no, they, they, it's a mandated fine, so they, they don't, they would have no basis for it. I mean, they can choose not to pay it, but they're not, well, it's not going to go away. I mean, we would pursue them through the formal legal channel if we needed to. Even though they were voluntary in the beginning, the terms of our agreement and the code, the way it was written in 2016, brought them under the term, all of the terms they're, they're of the just code. like a yeah. single operator. They're just, you know, they're just big and they just represent a whole bunch of operators yeah. underneath them. Yeah. So, so they have all the same requirements as a single operator. They, they also have the same requirement to submit a, a financial guarantee, and they did that. And then our code says after two consecutive years of complete compliance with the code, they can request to have the waiver of that approved by the CFO, so they did that, and so we, we waived their requirement. I mean, they've done everything just like an operator would do, a new operator under the code. Okay, so, okay. so, so you're hearing there's advantages to requiring everyone to register. Well, we don't see, <coughs> we don't don't see that advantage. Uh, it, it, First off, we can't guarantee or have high confidence that everyone will come and register. And then with the ones that do register, we can have it on file, and it's a lot of you know paperwork, but we're not going to actually be able to match it up to anything with respect to hosting platforms. So it's, we're basically just going to keep this information on file without really having a, a use for it. And so we, we would not recommend doing that. And we just don't think it serves a, a strong purpose in terms of what we're trying to achieve. So. And also, during the conversation I had yesterday with the Airbnb representative, in the jurisdictions where they have had this amendment that they've proposed with us, in <coughs> jurisdictions where that's been approved or they went ahead and just did it anyway, they do have, they changed their platform to where they would have a screen of some sort that would require the operator to actually input their registration number and so it's a little bit along the lines of what what's being talked about here, but it was to input a registration number and you know check a box and do like an electronic attesting that you you're complying. So then my very next question was, well, do you validate somehow that registration number that they've put in? And he said no. 
So really, I said then someone could just type in all ones or all nines or, you know, just to get past the screen, and he said yes. So even though they do have some sort of a mechanism like that that they're using in other places, they are not taking that extra step to validate with each individual taxing jurisdiction that they work with to make sure that it's an actual number, an actual live number. Yeah. Well, I just kind of want to follow up on that, too. Sure. Thank right. you, Mr. Chair. Um, so if somebody is using the Airbnb hosting site that they've not registered with the municipality, and then Airbnb basically takes a tax amount from that particular operator <coughs> getting a reservation, what do they do with that tax money then if there's no way to funnel that to the appropriate municipality or city? Well, yeah. So Airbnb, if they're assessing the tax on a particular transaction, because Airbnb controls the payment transaction. They charge a service fee, they, they have their line for occupancy tax, if that's part of the agreement. They're in control of that transaction. So they are actually charging the tax, the guest is paying it. The host never touches any of that. And so as she was describing, after all of that said and done, then the host just gets what Airbnb deems to be their share of that transaction, which would be aside from the tax amount. They would hold, Airbnb would hold the tax amount for whatever the time frame is until it needs to be filed and remitted to the jurisdiction. And they also notify the host that they have sent the yeah. tax to the jurisdiction. Right. That's, that's on their website. And they only do that if there's an agreement between Airbnb and the jurisdiction or it's mandatory. They Otherwise, they would not be assessing the tax. And then um, Mr. Dunbar said it earlier about Minnesota. I've rented places in Minnesota and there is not an occupancy tax line for Airbnb. So in that jurisdiction, mm -hmm. the host would be responsible for complying on their own with the taxing jurisdiction. And so I'm assuming that when I pay my amount that they are then going to take the correct amount of tax out of that and remit it to the jurisdiction. Okay, well I guess I'm getting at if somebody is using, Air, if a B and b is using Airbnb to get their reservations to fill their facility, Airbnb is assessing them a tax mm -hmm. amount. Assessing the guest the tax. Correct, assessing the guest. So if that, but if that Airbnb has never registered with the municipality that the tax should be going to, how, sorry, if that Airbnb, if the, if the B and B has not registered with the municipality that it exists in, what does Airbnb then do with that tax money that they have actually accrued or taken? So in the case of our jurisdiction, we provided Airbnb with a list of all of our zip codes, all the zip codes that fall under the municipal purview. And so that's the entire whole. And so any property, when, it, when the host registers with Airbnb and they go through that long process of all the pictures and whatnot, you have to provide your property location. And so the property locations of the zip code that falls within that matrix will then be automatically assessed the tax. And so Airbnb knows that we're the taxing jurisdiction for that matrix of zip codes. I don't know how they do it everywhere else, but I would assume it would probably be pretty similar. Okay, so... So in other words, they're really not necessarily looking at anybody's <coughs> registration number, like you said, they're not following up on that, but they are taking the tax and then sending that to whatever jurisdiction is within that zip code that they've got. That's very interesting. That's okay. Thank you. That's what they're doing for us. Okay. okay. I understand. Thank you. Mr. Wells. Thank you. I, just as an, an, a little add-on, I think this is just the start, and I really, really appreciate you going into this weedy area where it's difficult to find your way through, but be persistent and, and get it to be an established rule. And then we continue after that to get in all these lodging facilities that do business outside of the platforms. There are others, many, many others, that do not get permitted, but they have a different way of negotiating or finding their clients without being permitted. 
and to those that have started relationships with guests, the second time, say they come through a platform the first time, the second time they are already established. You know, I come back to you, I'll stay with you, they don't use the platform. Well, if that guest or that host is not having a permit, is not registered, that either uh, leads the host to not collect the bed tax, to be more competitive, or to keep the bed tax, charge it, but does not pass it on to the municipality because there's no record, no numbers established. Right, and, and I, I, we let this that same issue to come up a week ago when we talked to the association vice president, and the comment made from the city side was, we recognize that this is not a perfect world, we will never get to 100%. But if we can get all the big players and you know anyone that comes to us and, and says, look, my neighbor is doing something, can you go check it out, and we check all those out, that's the best we can do, but that's pretty darn good. Uh, so, but to try to, to design a system that's trying to like be 100%, it, there is a cost benefit there. And, uh, and like I said, we, we just, we're real careful about how we apply the resources to the enforcement. Uh, Mr. Wilson, then I believe. So I guess that leads to: Do you have any kind of audit powers? Oh yes, absolutely. You we could go to an unregistered mm -hmm. operator. We've done that many, many times. Yeah. Uh, can you just briefly, how does that play out? Uh, well, you want to talk about? Sure. So yeah, sure. So I have three desk auditors and I have three field auditors, and so that's the coverage for all of our program taxes, including room tax. So if we get any type of tip. We have, a, we have a link on the ANC Works website where people can give tips if there's suspicion of an unregistered operator. Any tip that we receive, we will investigate. And so uh, one of my tax enforcement officers has gone out to specific locations and has actually discovered you know, people who have maybe two or three rooms that they're renting and we've gotten them under compliance. So in that situation, there's some different considerations. It's have you been charging the tax? And if so, then we go back and we look at records and we assess the very large penalty. <coughs> there's also interest at 12% that accrues on the unpaid balance of tax, not on the penalty, but the tax. And then if they haven't been assessing the tax, then there's a decision about, okay, how far back do we go? Do they even have records? You know, There's lots of different considerations depending on the size, the nature, the sophistication of who's been operating Illegally, basically. Okay. Well, good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, I just have two, sorry, two final points. I mean, like Bridget said, I realize the purpose of this is for tax. It's a huge issue that is impacting, you know, the municipality, and so it's it's more than just the tax department; it's the planning department. But we but we haven't gone down that road. Right now, we're just kind of like, hey, let's take the tax. <laughs> And we're good with that. So if we do this, we need to continue to have those conversations on how we, I mean, our current practices are not meeting the goals that we've set as a municipality in our long range planning, um, but we're certainly willing to put forth uh, mechanisms to collect the tax. So we need to do the work on the back end of that then to make sure that we're collecting taxes from individuals that are doing what they're supposed to do. So we know we're collecting taxes not from subsidized affordable housing or that we're not collecting taxes from people who are renting out a whole house all year and still getting a residential property tax. Um, uh, thank you, exemption. Um, but then, so there is just that, but I've left those comments out because I realize that's not the purpose of this. Um, but then I wanna ask my question I asked earlier. In terms of enforcement or responsibility, once this passes, am I correct in that? So this no longer makes the tax for an operator who solely operates on a registered platform their responsibility. That's correct. Just because if this does pass on the 20th, it doesn't mean that all of those hosting platforms that are not currently registered with us are automatically registered. There will there is a period of time where we will have to get them into compliance with the code. So, um, is that language in here that it is the operator's responsibility then to ensure that their platform is registered? 
everything because it's kind of just dicey like, who's so responsibility on, the taxes. On our, on our website, we have a comprehensive list of every entity that's registered, including Airbnb. So when booking.com or VRBO, when they do come on board, anyone can see, any operator, anyone can see they are registered you know, with us. And that's when you talk about verifying registration, that's important because an individual operator should not assume, well, gosh, I use booking.com and they just passed the ordinance Tuesday night and on Wednesday I don't need to pay anymore. It's like we're not gonna get booking.com on board you know, immediately, it's gonna take a while. So that's a very good point. And we, we can probably do a special letter to the entire set of operators saying this ordinance just passed, please regularly or periodically consult our website, make sure that these online platforms are registered with us. If they're not, you're still on the hook to pay the tax. We can definitely do that. It's a very good suggestion. So. And in the ordinance itself, it talks about hosting platform as a definition, and then it talks about the responsibilities of a registered hosting platform. So it's that the registration of the hosting platform that triggers the, the, the ability of, of us to add it to that list, and that's when the, the responsibility would shift, because otherwise then there would be two sets of taxes being paid. Thank you. I have to move on. Uh, Ms. LaFrance? A uh, quick question to you both. Is there any concern then with the ordinance going into effect immediately? I think the sooner the better so that we can start talking and then basically saying a law has been passed and you all need to comply. So, yeah, that, that would help us. Thank you, Ms. LaFrance. Um, it has to be really short. Just a very tiny comment. The number, the tax collect number that a uh, 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 bed and breakfast operator receives is based on the permit that the city issues everybody that applies an, an application you have so many like maybe 20 points that you have to be compliant with you cannot get the bed tax collection permit number unless the business license or the permit, the bed and breakfast license has been issued. And that is a process all on its own. And most owners that want to go fly under the radar don't want to use that process. They can offer their client any kind of standard that they choose that are atrocious. No safety, safety issues are required of those that don't have that bed and breakfast permit. Yeah, really brief. Well, but you address that. We have code enforcement, so it's customer driven. So we're, we're summoned to know about this because hey, this guy's rent room. Well, they can report to us on tax, or they can report to the code enforcement people on any type of violation there. So, so those are legitimate points, but you have a way. Yeah. And, and just to, I'm sorry, just to confirm though, the permit, there's the registration with Treasury for tax, but there's the permit, but that's only for bed and breakfast. We have lots of different types of taxpayers, it's but it's only on the bed and breakfast. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. All right, so if you guys have any amendments, please get them in ASAP. Thank you.